Again, I always appreciate the opportunity to uh, deliver a message to you, and I hope it's of benefit to you. Yeah. A number of us are historians. I think <coughs> this story in the crowd are either sick or speaking to you, but uh, anyway, we owe a, a great deal of gratitude to those in the late uh, 18th and early 19th centuries who sought to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, that is, the Jerusalem above, above Galatians 4.26, that had been uh, broken <coughs> and replaced its gates burned with fire in Nehemiah uh, chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> they, like uh, Nehemiah of old, sat down and wept. And they may not have done it literally, but they saw uh, the spiritual condition of the churches at that time. And so spiritually speaking, they sat down and wept. <clears throat> also, like Nehemiah, they determined to do something about it. They went about restoring the New Testament church to exactly as it was in the first century and to observe and practice only the doctrine set forth on the pages of the New Testament. But there was an element of Samaritans, if you will, within the modern spiritual Jerusalem that went about hindering the effort to restore the ancient order of the New Testament. And they're doing that today. <clears throat> These efforts are, of course, continuing today, and sadly, they have achieved remarkable results. The book of Nehemiah has relevance today to the problems we face as we try to rebuild the walls, so to speak, of the church according to the New Testament pattern. We read in Nehemiah, the first chapter, that some of Nehemiah's brethren from Jerusalem reported that there were survivors who had escaped from the captivity of the Jews and were in great distress and reproach. These brethren <coughs> also reported that the wall of Jerusalem was broken down and its gates burned with fire. Now, in those times, a city uh, could not be a great city in the absence of a protective wall and a secure gate. Thus, any claim that Jerusalem might have had to greatness was portrayed by its lack of a wall and gate. This sorely distressed Nehemiah, and he determined to do something about it. And it distressed the restorers of the ancient order that the church had no walls and no gate. And they determined to do something about it. Almost immediately, Nehemiah met opposition. <clears throat> First, there was ridicule. We read in Nehemiah, the second chapter, verses 17, through the end of that chapter, verse, verse 1 of chapter 3, that after Nehemiah had spoken to the people about the hand of God and the king and, and all of this, <clears throat> that they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to do this good work. Their opposition came from those in Samaria. But when Sanballat the Horite, and Tobiah the Hamanite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? Nehemiah was not intimidated by such ridicule. He did not compromise for a moment his determination to restore ancient Jerusalem. He answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, <clears throat> we servants will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. We further read in Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 6, that when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? 
Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up into it, he will break down their stone wall. <clears throat> the people that built the wall despite the intimidation. So it says in verse 6, so we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. A more subtle and perhaps a more insidious approach employed by the Samaritans was compromise. In Nehemiah the 6th chapter, verses 1 through 4, we read, Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there was no breaks left in it, although at the time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem said to me, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent, this, uh, they sent me this message four times, and I answered in the same manner. Nehemiah's opponents uh, were saying, in effect, now let's be friends. We had our differences in the past. Now, however, you have accomplished what we never thought you could. You built the wall of Jerusalem. Whether we like it or not, we are neighbors. We need to get along with one another. It is time for a summit conference. We can meet, resolve our differences, and plan for a peaceful coexistence. There are those, more common than not, who invite us to the plain of Ono in hopes of compromising the work on the walls of the spiritual Jerusalem. They do not want confrontation, but dialogue. Their intention is to have peace and so-called unity without eradicating the, those scripturally unauthorized practices that caused the division in the first place. Confrontation of error is exactly what we need. The church has always prospered in times of persecution when it was called upon to defend the faith, faith once delivered. In January 1946, <clears throat> that's before even your truly was here, <laughs> uh, Foy Wallace Jr. made a series of speeches at the uh, music hall that's, that's long uh, since demolished along with Coliseum, although when I moved here, it was still here. But anyway, uh, the music hall in downtown Houston, uh, which were all incorporated into the book Bulwarks of the Faith, they had this to say about spiritual compromise. Apostasy, uh, apostasy starts in an attitude towards truth. Go back over the years of the Restoration Movement when a few noble men laid down the proposition to speak where the Bible speaks and to be silent where the Bible is silent. That was the plea on which the restoration of the New Testament order of things was proposed. But there grew up an element within, uh, within whose attitude towards that principle changed. The attitude towards the gospel changed. Compromise becomes the order of the day. They would not endure sound doctrine. <clears throat> they had itching ears. They heaped to themselves teachers after their own lust. They turned into fables. When ears itch, they have to be scratched. The itch just has to be scratched. So when the ears get the itch, they have to be scratched. The particular one to do the scratching, in that case, is the teacher. So with itching ears, they engage themselves teacher after their own desires. It could be said that these named above have met in the plain of Ono. Brother Wallace goes on to say in part, affiliation with air exists first 
in the wrong attitude toward truth. Second, an affiliation with error. Third, an abandonment of truth, a turning away from it, not even entertaining it. And fourth, turning into fables. That's the doctrines of men. And upon that, apostasy is complete. When compromise fell to works, Sanballat was not done. As we read in Nehemiah, the sixth chapter, verses five through nine, he appeared as a, as a friend to uh, Nehemiah to report slanderous charges made by Geshem. Sanballat, as Nehemiah's putative friend, suggested that he and Nehemiah consult together about the matter. Nehemiah would have none of it and refused Sanballat's offer. It reads, and Sanballat sent his servant to me and before, as before, the fifth time <clears throat> with an open letter in his hand in it was written, it is reported among the nations. And Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid, saying, Their hands will be weakened in the work, and they will not be done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. <clears throat> Sanballat, a frost friend, sought to impugn Nehemiah's character by recording gossip, if you will. That was an intentional fabrication with the intent of making Nehemiah afraid. It didn't work. However, today there are those who would and have yielded to threats of loss of fortune and influence unless accommodations are made for error. There is no more, this is no more than meeting in the plain of Ono. But Sandblad was not done. After all other attempts at compromise had failed, Sanblad tried, tried intimidation, <clears throat> as reported in Nehemiah, the sixth chapter, verses 10 through 13. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehethabel, and, uh, well, Jonathan, if you might want to tell Eric and them that if they need some names, here's some, here's some good names there. <clears throat> uh, who was the secret informant, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. Indeed at night they will come to kill you. So that was a pretty immediate threat. <clears throat> and I said, should a man, such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. For this reason he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way and sin so they might have cause for an evil report that they may uh, reproach me. <clears throat> Nehemiah rec recognized his responsibilities to the people. He could not lead where he was unwilling to go himself. He was not willing to enter that part of the temple unauthorized for him to enter. He would not violate the law of God in order to protect his own life. <clears throat> when doing the right thing and refusing to do the wrong thing, his reply was clear and simple with no room for negotiation. He demonstrated that he was no coward when it came to obeying the truth. In fact, he saved his life by keeping God's law, not by breaking it. Apparently, there were other attempts to get Nehemiah to compromise, but he would not. We read in Nehemiah, the sixth chapter, verse 14, My God remembered, remembered to buy in Sambalat according to these their works, and the prophetess uh, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. So there were other people that were trying to get him to compromise, too. He left the punishment to God. 
He stood firm in the face of many who were attempting to cause him to sin. God is glorified whenever people do what God has commanded. God blesses such obedience, even when the enemies of God do all they can to frustrate the work. Persistent in God's work pays great dividends, Matthew 7, chapter verse 21, and yields influence for good even among those uh, who are opposed to the truth, Matthew 5, chapter verse 16. The work uh, had been done in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem was an example of a great and noble effort. It had been accomplished by a relatively pious people faced with much opposition and many obstacles in a short period of time. The people round about could not but recognize what the God of Israel had accomplished through his service. With God, all things were possible, Matthew 19, verse 26. I offer you this short lesson as a uh, means of encouragement that we not meet on the plane of Ono, that we never compromise the truth. We always stand for the right and do the right. So I want to offer this opportunity uh, now for anybody that <clears throat> needs to do right, to make things right, to have that opportunity to do it as we stand and sing. <clears throat>